What's going on everybody, it's Charles. In this video, we're gonna talk about all the things that you need to look at before you buy a Mark IV R32. There's rarely a day that goes by that I don't get an email saying, hey Charles, what do I need to look at if I'm gonna buy a Mark IV R32? So today, we're gonna to cover all of those things. Now, I'm gonna be hitting on really the most common things that happen to these cars. You can actually use this guide pretty much as a Mark IV buying guide as well. And a lot of this stuff is going to apply to any car, no matter what it is. Of course, the R32 has a couple of unique things that we're going to focus on. Also, none of these things really are a deal breaker on whether you should buy or not buy the car. Of course, there are also other things that could be wrong that maybe just aren't super common on the Mark IV. I want this to be a buying guide to buying a Mark IV R32. So after this video, if you have some other things that you've seen comment on these cars, drop that down in the comments so we can have a complete community built Mark IV R32 buying guide. You are also going to learn hands down the thing that terrifies me the most when dealing with these cars. But first, let's start under the hood. First thing I like to do when I get under the hood is just take an initial inspection and kind of see what's going on. Is there a bunch of leaves up in the cowl, meaning that someone maybe didn't keep the car clean? Is the engine cover there? Is the battery secured down properly? Are the fluids topped off in full? Just a quick basic overview of the whole entire engine compartment. The number one problem you're gonna hear people complain about on the R32s is going to be chain failure. Let me be very clear. Chain failure on the R32 is not super common. This is not a two liter TSI. This is not a triple A VR6. These are pretty solid. However, chain wear, chain failure does happen. Usually the first sign of a chain being out of specification is a rattle on startup. So we're going to keep that in mind when we get in the car and when we drive it, that on that first startup, we may want to have the hood up and listen for some chain rattle. We can also use our scan tool, VCDS or whatever, to see how far our adjustments are out. Our specification there is negative eight to positive eight, with six to seven kind of being my threshold for, hey, it's time to get chains. And while a chain job is not a deal breaker, that's a pretty expensive repair if you're paying someone to do it. So you definitely wanna be aware of whether the car is going to need chains and guides and all that at some point soon. The next thing we're going to look for is going to be oil leaks. Now, it's pretty tough to see a whole lot of what's going on on this engine because there's a whole lot going on on this engine, especially on the top side. So we're gonna do an initial inspection for oil leaks just under the hood. We're going to finish that inspection with the car off the ground. The key place we're looking for on the top side is going to be the valve cover leaking. So we wanna take a look all around the valve cover to see if we have any oil residue or actual active leaking oil. There's two really common places for topside engine oil leaks. Along the passenger side where the serpentine belt is, typically coming from the valve cover. Along the transmission side on the driver's side of the vehicle, not usually coming from the valve cover, but it is possible. The more common place is going to be actually the head gasket leaking where the timing chains are. Pretty clear that someone did some work on this car. It looks like we're missing a bolt there. We got a lot of schmutz on the head gasket. Hard to see, but that bolt down there is actually not tight. In addition to looking for straight failures in the vehicle, we're also looking for poor workmanship throughout this vehicle's life. Once we're confident we know all the oil leaks, let's focus on coolant leaks. And that's gonna start with looking to see how much coolant is in the bottle but that doesn't always tell the whole story. So start with checking the bottle. Then we're gonna move over to the driver's side because that's really where most of our coolant hoses live on the top side of our engine. We can start at the back looking at our hoses to and from the heater core. We can follow that underneath the air intake and that's gonna bring us to the area where there's two really common leak points. We have this little elbow right here with the tiny little nipple. This leaks a lot. In fact, they get super fragile. Shockingly enough, it's plastic. I actually think mine is leaking just a little bit. Look for coolant residue, but if the car is hot, don't touch it. In fact, I probably wouldn't touch it no matter what. That can get sad on you really, really fast. The other really common place is going to be our thermostat housing and crack pipe which comes from the other side of the block. This also houses our coolant temperature sensors. You can kind of see them way down in there. That's one of the plugs for our coolant temp sensor. These are also another common point for leaking coolant. 
you'll usually see a bunch of pink crusties on top of the transmission or once we get underneath the car, you'll really see it then too. The great thing about VW coolant is that it's pink or pinkish purple and it leaves a crusty trail when it leaks. So they're usually pretty easy to spot. While we are talking about coolant, cooling fans and the fan controls is another pretty common place that we see issues. I'll usually start by taking the battery cover off, assuming that there is one. Open up this fuse panel and take a look in here. This is a very common Mark IV failure point for both the alternator fuse with the cable burning up or the alternator overdrawing or the cooling fans. So alternator, cooling fans. This fuse right here is also another fuse that can melt because of fan control module issues leading to cooling fan or air conditioning issues. So I almost always pull this fuse out and take a look at it and see if it's melted. This is what the fuse looked like from the factory. So if it doesn't look exactly like this 30 amp fuse here, it's probably, this whole housing's probably been replaced at some point. Not a bad thing, just something to take a look at. We also have the fan control module, which you can't really see from the top side or the bottom side. It's kind of buried up in the frame rail. The other issue is cooling fans not coming on. Now my car doesn't have any refrigerant in it because we're prepping it to build a big high horsepower car. What you're gonna do when you get in your car for your test drive, start it with the hood up, listen for your cold start rattle, then turn the air conditioning on all the way and make sure both fans come on. Both of those fans need to come on after a few seconds of the air conditioning coming on. Failing cooling fans, bad fuse housing, bad fan control module, are all pretty common issues on Mark IVs across the board. Next, we wanna take a look at our vacuum lines. This can actually get a little tricky because there's so much going on underneath the hood and a lot of the sheathing for wiring may actually look like vacuum lines. Some vacuum lines are plastic like this one that don't look like a traditional VW vacuum line, at least of this vintage anyway. This is probably the place where you wanna spend the most time looking very slowly. Of course, the engine cover is gonna come off for this inspection. We're looking for anything broken, anything new, because I kinda of like to know when someone replaces something. Most importantly though, anything that looks out of the ordinary. A lot of times what'll happen is something will break and rather than replacing a pretty expensive hose, it'll get repaired. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's just something I wanna be aware of. Here's a perfect example of this. This is our breather hose right here. Right there, you can see it's been taped. Now, it's holding for now. It's not a huge deal, but in the future, that may be problematic. So you wanna make sure that you're aware of this kind of stuff. All this, this is a vacuum hose. This is a vacuum hose. That elbow there has vacuum in it. Here's another place where looking at for someone else's repairs is a good choice. That's been epoxied with an odd size elbow. So not a factory setup there. Not a big deal, it's holding, it's probably working. But again, something we wanna be aware of. All these hoses breaking are somewhat common, so definitely worth a look. The line from the N80 valve is another place I see commonly failing. You can see we got this T here blocked off. It's doing its job, actually. There's no fault for N80 or, uh, or EVAP purge flow. But that is not a factory setup, it's a factory hose. It's just not what it's supposed to be. I'm guessing the little connection broke. Over here on the driver's side, most of this is actually electrical wiring. This is a vacuum line right here. You can see it goes to the manifold. It's also broken. Then we have this here at the fuel pressure regulator. Well, not a vacuum line. Another common place to have a vacuum leak is going to be on the intake flap runner. This is our intake flap runner. It's vacuum controlled, so you could have a leak at the diaphragm. Or what usually happens is that green seal behind this white runner piece starts to leak. So this can be a source of a vacuum leak here, around here. They do make rebuild kits for it, so you don't need a whole manifold if you find that leaking. I touched on the battery a little bit. Let's take a more in-depth look. We wanna make sure we're looking at our cables Make sure they're good and snug. This section right here is also another somewhat common mark for a failure point. I've seen a lot of this nut loose, as a matter of fact. We also wanna make sure that our battery is properly secured. 
This one is missing the hold down, but that's my fault. I left it out. Give that battery a good wiggle and see if it's loose. Also, ground cable on Mark IV is a common failure point. The ground station underneath the battery gets corroded, causes really weird electrical issues, so you want to keep that in mind. But check out that bolt to the transmission right here that looks like it's loose is also missing a ground strap. There should be a ground from that negative cable to that point right there. Odds are yours isn't gonna be that way, but this one is. Another thing we wanna look at is going to be engine and transmission mounts. Now, the transmission mount is underneath the air filter and can be a little tricky to see without taking the air box and everything out. What I usually do is I focus on the engine mount on the passenger side, and if the engine mount is worn out, we can just make the assumption that's probably not too wild of an assumption that the transmission mount is also worn out. This can be a little tricky to see. Sometimes it's worn so much that the engine is really sagged on the passenger side. This one is worn out pretty good, but let me show you what I look at. So I come down here right behind the washer fluid bottle, and here's our engine mount right here. If we look just below it, you can see that black rubber pad right there. If that bit of rubber right there is anywhere near the bottom side of the mount, the mount is worn out. You can see that bit of rubber there in the mirror. It's pretty close to that lower side of the mount. The engine mount in the blue car is about a year old. We can see that gap between the rubber and the bottom of the mount is much bigger. That's what it should look like. This bit of rubber is usually centered between the metal parts of the mount. So if it's way sagging, it'll be much closer to the bottom. So something else you can do if you want a little bit better view, take your phone upside down, start recording a video, drop your phone right between the N80 valve and the power steering fluid reservoir, and you can get a good look at just how bad that engine mount is. Exactly what I talked about, the rubber really close to the bottom, and look at that, all worn out and broken. That center part right there where you can see some metal, is the piece that actually goes to the engine side and bolts to the bracket that bolts to the engine. For comparison, this is the mount on the blue R32. Next, I like to take a look at the shifter cables. We'll feel what the shifter feels like when we get in the car, but I like to look at the cables while I'm right here. The shifter cables are located right between the airbox and where the engine is, just below both of them. So if we go right down in that gap there, we'll be able to see our shifter cables. There's one, and the other one's kind of buried underneath that coolant line. If we look really close at the rubber on the shifter cable end, we can see that it's cracked. That can lead to a weird shift feel and poor shifting performance, so you'll want to take a look at both of them. Check the lower one and go ahead and check the upper one. If you want to take it off, lift up on the clip, slide the clip out, and you can just pull the cable all the way off or use your inspection mirror if this is not your car, I probably wouldn't take that off. Take a good look at the other one. If that one's split, plan on fixing both of them. All right, there's a few more things, kind of not really engine related, I like to look at under the hood. This is gonna give us an idea of potential front end damage that's happened to the vehicle at some point. It's gonna give us a clue in on who's been working on the car, and also a quick check on the suspension. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look down the fenders at the bolts that hold the fender to the vehicle and see if the paint is intact or if it looks like the bolts have been turned, any witness marks where the paint doesn't really line up. That'll give us an indication that the fender's been removed. I'm also gonna do that same inspection on the hood hinges. We'll do that both on the left and the right side. Also, the bolts right here that hold the core support to the body of the car, that's a pretty common place for water and debris to collect maybe a good place to check for any vehicle rust. The other thing I wanna look at is the top of the strut towers. This may point to an issue with the front suspension, specifically the strut mount bushings that tend to collapse. As we see on the passenger side, the gap between the top of the shock absorber and the body of the car is pretty small. When we come over to the driver's side, we can see that gap is huge. So that says to me that we probably have an issue on the driver's side front suspension. We'll do some more testing when we get the car up in the air. This is just something to take a two second look at so you know you need to do a more in-depth inspection underneath. I also take a good look at the core support. You'll notice that there's those two stickers on the core support, three stickers, and then there's one that's actually missing, but you can see the residue of where it's at. 
Oftentimes when a car's in a front end collision and the core support is replaced, those stickers don't get put back on. Sometimes they do, most of the time they don't. So if you see a blank core support, that means at some point it's probably been replaced. Not always does that kind of stuff show up on a Carfax. And finally, as silly as this sounds, I look at the routing of the hood release cable. This is our hood release cable right here behind the driver's headlight. The way it's supposed to route is through this air duct, it should come out right here and go on the outside of this other section of air ducting. Very rarely are they installed properly. Usually they're like this or they're all crammed back behind here and it comes out right in this section. If you have one installed properly, that means someone did an extra good job putting the car back together when they had it apart, or maybe it's never even been apart before. Next thing I'm gonna do is take a look at the overall condition of the exterior of the vehicle. Usually this is kind of the easiest one to do because oftentimes big major issues really, really stand out and you don't have to have had seen a million of these engines in order to identify something that's out of place. For example, this is not installed properly. Something that potentially could be an issue is this lower grille is not installed. Also, this bumper cover is completely broken. Five years ago, that may not be an issue, but these are not available new anymore. And if you find a used bumper, you're paying big bucks for it. What I also focus on is body gaps. Gaps between the fender and the bumper. This is not correct. That's why. What does it look like around the headlight? I'm also looking at the headlight to see how much oxidation is on it. These are plastic from the factory in the US, but we're looking at every gap in the car, every body gap. We'll also notice some common rusting points like the bottoms of the fenders, behind the side skirts, debris gets trapped up behind the fender liner, and wet leaves sit behind here and rust that. We're looking for any paint issues. This car had a roof rack on it at some point. That's the leftover residue from it. I also look to see if it has factory glass because the factory glass is marked with a VW stamp on it. So this left front window is a factory window. Look at your door gapping, both left to right and along the bottom. Some dirt doesn't matter. I don't care about that. Scratches and things like that, rust are the things I do care about. There's some scuffing and some dents. This is a hard place to, to PDR a dent. That's worth noting. Go ahead and take a look at the wheels too. These wheels can be pretty soft. Little curb rash, little scuff, I don't care about that. Take a look around all the lights, the back bumper. This one doesn't sit quite perfectly, but it's not terrible. Compare that to how the blue one sits. That's not even close. Pop the trunk. Look for witness marks. Look at these boots and see if they're split. Wiring damage here is common. Make sure your bumper's centered on your taillights. Fuel door sits properly. Here's another common rust place. Here's another, another common rust place. Confirmed we got VW glass. Confirmed we have VW glass, not VW glass. So this windshield has been replaced at some point. That is not a deal breaker. But what that leads me to do is check to make sure that the cowl's properly installed, which I'll be honest, rarely are they properly installed. I also give these lights a little jiggle because if they're loose, they'll jiggle and then usually they fall out. Same with these in the bumper. Here's some more of our bumper damage. You'll want to know these bumper covers are super expensive on the R32. If it's another Mark IV, I don't care quite so much. These high dollar and not available. We also want to make sure we take a good look at the wheels. Some curb rash on the wheel, not a big deal. We do want to, however, look for any evidence of cracking or bending, because that can be a pretty significant safety issue. All right, our next set of inspections, I'm going to show you a way to do it on the ground. However, doing this on the ground is not a substitute for doing a proper suspension inspection with the car off the ground. This is just something you can do really quick while you're taking a look at the car before you bring it somewhere and either do this inspection yourself 
or have a pre-purchase inspection done on the car. If you are buying an R32, you are probably not spending like 700 bucks. And if you are, who cares what condition it's in? You're spending a few thousand to several thousand dollars. This makes paying $100 to $150 for a pre-purchase inspection worth every penny. But here's some things we can check really quick. First, I like to turn the wheel all the way to the opposite side of the side we're looking on. So we're looking at the driver's side here. The wheel is turned all the way to the passenger side. This is going to expose part of the suspension. This is going to expose the tire that we're gonna take a very, very brief look at. Let's start real quick with our brake setup. These brakes on this car are awful. You can see there's hardly any contact patch with the actual brake pad. It's mostly oxidation. If you have a rotor like this, especially a slotted one, go ahead and plan for a brake replacement because you're probably not going to just clean that off enough to make the stopping correct. We can also look to see how much brake pad we actually have left. You may need to move the car back or forward a little bit to actually see it. Also make sure that this brake pad retainer is on here as well. Caliper should be blue, ideally, from the factory. Uh, if they're not, that's not a huge deal either. These look like they need to be taken down and refinished. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our phone, we're gonna set it into video mode, because we can't always see everything. So we sometimes can just record a video and then take a look. You'll wanna take a quick look at the tire. I'll be honest, I don't pay too much attention to tires when we deal with R32. If this were any other type of used car, I'd be focused way more on the tires, but it is worth taking a look at how much tread depth you have and make sure you don't have any dry rotting. Let's go underneath the car and start on the control arms. You want to look at this control arm bushing. Take your phone back around. Look at the ball joint here. Go underneath if you can. See if these nuts look normal or if there's any witness marks like they're not tight. Look for any cracking or grease leaking out of the ball joint boot. Note that nut is new. So someone's done some work recently on this car. Also that ABS ring looks brand new. We did know though on this one that someone's done some work over here. Look at the boot on the tie rod end. Look at the jam nut on the tie rod. Make sure it looks tight. Be sure you're taking a look at the CV boot. We're looking for any cracking or splitting in the ribs of the CV boot. Look at how your brake cables are routed. This is just all floppity right here. This is not right. This is the brake wear indicator because someone probably didn't put factory pads back on it. And make sure you look at the sway bar end link, which is way up here. If you look close, this boot's come apart. That'll be something that definitely needs attention right up there. Also go ahead and look at the lower one and be sure to look at your inner CV boot too. You still want to get this off the ground and check it. I know that there's some issues with this control arm bushing, but they're pretty hard to see just right here. It's real easy to see when the car's off the ground. Next, we're going to do a quick suspension evaluation. We're going to do this for the left and the right side the same way. This is with the car off the ground. With the steering wheel unlocked, we're going to wiggle the wheel back and forth with our hands at 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. You're listening and feeling for any kind of clunking. If you feel a clunk, that usually is an issue with the tie rod or the tie rod end, could also be a wheel bearing. So we're gonna do that back and forth and note any issues. We're also gonna go at 12 o'clock and six o'clock and do the same thing. This is going to be feeling for play in the lower ball joint on this particular suspension. I don't feel play in either one. There's a third thing that we wanna do and that's to check for play at the top upper strut mount that we saw that this side may have had an issue when we were looking under the hood. What we're gonna do is we're gonna push up on the whole wheel and tire a strut assembly. When you push up on that, if you feel the whole assembly move, take a look up at that top strut mount bushing and see if that's where your movement's coming from because, well, that's probably where your movement's coming from. And because we have a nice big gap between the wheel and the fender, Let's go ahead and look at our shock absorber. Take a good look at this spring. These springs have been known to rust and break. Not as common as like the Mark V stuff, but still something you want to look at. Also, while I'm here though, another good opportunity to take a look and be sure that the fender liner is there and that all the bolts are attached. This is not attached. Moving on to underneath the car, we got a lot that we need to check up under here. First thing I like to do is look to see what's there and what's missing. And we'll notice on this car right away that we have no belly pan. We have uh, only one of these air dams on the driver's side. 
Shockingly enough, shouldn't come as too much of a surprise with the bumper cover all broken that we're missing the air ducting over here on this side. We're also missing the belt skirt over here on this side, so things to all note that are missing on the car. Now the fact that we're missing some stuff actually works out really well for our inspections because we don't have to worry about taking a pan off or anything like that. So we're gonna start right up here at the front. These are the most common things. These bushings, these dampers for the secondary air pump break all the time. This is a common Mark IV issue. Usually it won't get a check engine light or anything like that, but braking is super common. You can get these separate and they're, uh, they're actually pretty easy and cheap to replace. A really common source of oil leaks is going to be the oil filter and oil filter housing. Either the inner portion here or the whole housing itself will leak. Also, take a really good look inside that service plug. Most of them are stripped out. You can still do the oil change. It's just nice to know whether it's gonna be a problem or not before you start. We're gonna take a good look at our oil pan and look for oil leaks. This is a brand new oil pan, it looks like. So we're pretty good here, but we do have some oil residue up above that we wanna be aware of. Also right here is the after run coolant pump. This is another source of a coolant leak that's somewhat common. So you wanna take a look at that. Also earlier I mentioned the crack pipe that goes from the water pump over to the thermostat housing. This is usually, this area right here is usually where you'll see that leaking. We'll come over here to the belt side and just take a look and make sure our serpentine belt is good and there. We can usually see any witness marks on the crank bolt to know what work's been done to the front side. Looks like there's some witness marks there. You also want to turn around and face the front of the car and look at your radiator for coolant leaks. You want to look for any AC dye or oil from the air conditioner. We're looking for coolant leaks and we're also looking for core support damage, this piece right here. Our junctions are almost always the most common leak points. Here's our power steering line that's all rusted. Look inside the bolt, drain bolt for the transmission, see if that looks like it's been serviced. I can't tell, it doesn't look like it's been serviced in a while, but there are some marks up in it. We'll take a look at our dog bone, that's a common break point here in here because of not being torqued down properly. This has got an aftermarket dog bone mount in it, which is not a big deal. We want to look at our bevel box, look for any leaks on our bevel box. This is part of our all-wheel drive system. We'll look at our inner CV joint, outer CV joints again. Looks like we actually have a little bit of oil down here on the bottom. Not sure really where that's coming from probably the front side up here. Looking up on top near the transmission is another place you wanna to check to see if you have coolant running down. That coolant flange can be an issue. You got some rust right there. That may end up being problematic for that hose. And let's do another inspection on our suspension now that we can actually get under here and take a look. We wanna double check our sway bar end links. We wanna look at this front bushing now that we're in a place where we can see it a little bit better. I mentioned earlier looking at the control arm bushings, the rear ones, with the car off the ground. This is why, notice the control arm bushing is not even close to being in the right spot inside the control arm. This is probably one of the main contributing factors to the suspension issues of this car when I got it. You see a lot of oxidation, not a bad idea to hit it with some penetrating oil at this point in time, so that when you do the work, uh, it's a little bit easier. We also want to look down this front side of the engine to make sure that we don't have any coolant leaking from our water pump. That is a, uh, I don't know, somewhat common, but not super common issue. Let's move down the rest of the car. I'm going to point out some things on this particular exact car that are issues. They may not be super common, but they're worth noting. I did this, so, you know, if you, I don't know, if you do see this hanging down, you want to address it, but don't worry too much about that. The big things underneath for me are going to be dealing with destroyed pinch welds. Look at that, crushed, crushed, crushed. So for those of you that wanted to know why I had it lifted like this, well, it's because of that. We also wanna note our oxidation level on things like our catalytic converter. This one's pretty rusted. It's probably gonna end up getting cut off. Look for any power steering leaks. Look at this side. This side pinch weld is probably even worse. Now from here back, the car's not too terribly bad. We want to be sure we don't have any exhaust leaks from that clamp right there, any fuel leaks from our fuel filter, issues with our tank. The parking brakes barely works on this car, but I don't think that it's cable related, at least 
not as far as we can tell. It's probably more in the caliper. We want to look at all this stuff going on back here. This is going to be challenging to deal with. Be sure to look at your spring, your arms, your axles, inner and outer CV joints, leaks from our diff. We want to look at our Haldex unit and be sure it's not leaking. I have the sway bar disconnected and the shock absorbers <laughs> removed for a video. You want to make sure your shock absorbers aren't leaking. That could be problematic and also fail a state inspection. Take a good look at your springs. The hats where the springs sit, so that piece right there and this piece right here are also really common wear points. They're maintenance items. I replaced them on my blue one when we did the springs and shock absorbers. So take a quick look at that. You can see someone did a, oh man, someone did some happiness right there. The other point you wanna take a good look at is on the prop shaft. Now these don't have the center carrier bearing failures like the Torags do. What usually fails is the rubber piece connecting the prop shaft to the Haldex and to up to the bevel box. The rubber splits and it could cause a vibration. They are available separate at this point in time. Oh, and anytime you see a rubber bushing, take a look at it and see if it needs to be replaced. Take a good look at that rubber piece from the prop shaft to the bevel box. Finally, while we're back here, this is probably not of any relevant importance at all whatsoever, but I always like to look to see if the flapper has been disabled or not. And as you can see, this one has been disabled. Zip me. Does that bracket look pretty darn new compared to the rest of the underneath here? Finally, let's move on to the interior. A lot of this stuff is very, very common across the board on Mark IVs. First and foremost, door latch failures may be one of the most common VW issues across the board ever in the history of the world. You could probably just plan for replacing one of those. A quick check is open the door and see if the dome lights come on or the little light down in the door. If they don't, you may have a door latch issue. Also though, we wanna look at the door striker right here and be sure it's not loose. This being loose can lead to the door not shutting properly and actually can damage the door sill area. Take a look at your lower door sill and make sure it says R32. We also wanna look at our hinges for our door. Usually these can get pretty rusted up as you can see here. The big thing though, has that sunroof drain been cut? That is a not cut sunroof drain. That not being cut can lead to the sunroof tube getting clogged and cause a leak in your car. It happened to me on the blue one. I did a video on how to fix it. I'll link for you. Now, I have this door panel off of this car, but luckily it's sitting right here. Some main common things to look out for on these door panels, of course, are gonna be like broken knobs, broken switches, that kind of stuff. This is the number one issue I've ran into, this leather gets really, really loose. The glue comes out and apart from between, you can see it's all nasty and gross. This panel is the one out of the blue car. Southern cars usually have this worse than Northern cars. So this leather coming away is problematic, but also the panel itself breaking can be an issue too. You can see it's all coming apart right there. Not a deal breaker, definitely something though that you wanna be aware of. We also really want to focus on the driver's seat. Obviously, this is the most used seat in the car, so we want to focus here. Typically, the side bolster comes apart or gets flattened and worn, both on the butt part and the backrest part. Even though from like right here, this one looks okay, let's get in a little closer. You can see it's actually been sewn and repaired. Look at the stitching up here, especially down the middle. And then as I follow this down to the bolster side, you can see someone repaired it. It doesn't look bad. I've seen them fixed. Usually you can tell, if you look at the stitching, you can usually tell, and I always like to look at the stitching on this whole side versus this side on the passenger side, because this is rarely an issue. This one's usually an issue. That'll give you a good indicator of whether it's been fixed. May just be a crushed bolster or worn out right here at the side or on the bottom. This one's not too terribly bad, but we can see our leather's cracked all throughout. Because this is a Mark IV, you can expect broken trim and stuff like that. This one's in decent shape. The shifter's in decent shape. The steering wheel is in decent shape. What I really focus on is this little lumpy, lumpy, humpy right here in the front. Some may call it a defroster vent. Uh, usually the dash gets distorted. Again, worse on Southern cars than Northern cars. I also take a good look at the headliner and all the pillars. 
this headliner is pretty good until you get over here in like these corners and then you can see the glue starting to come apart. Check your handles. You can see our B pillar actually is coming apart right there on the corner. Also, while we're on the inside of the car, we want to make sure that everything works. Turn the climatronic on it, make sure it works. Turn the radio on, the flashers, the heated seats, push all the buttons with the car running, make sure everything works. I mentioned about the shifter earlier. The way I like to test these shifters is with the car in neutral, I'll wiggle it, of course, back and forth and front to back. Then what I'll do with the car off, I'll put it in first gear and check that side to side motion out like that. This has obviously worn shifter bushings. We saw what they looked like under the hood. This is in gear. That's a ton of movement. So this shifter does need to be rebuilt, probably both in the shifter box inside the car. And of course our shifter ends at the transmission. Make sure the parking brake works. Make sure the radios work, the windows work, like touch all the buttons. You wanna make sure that all this stuff works. And if it doesn't, that's a great bargaining tool for when you are buying the car. Hey, the window doesn't work. Give me some money off. Make sure you open the glove box. That's a common breaking point as well. Move the seats up and down. Do a thorough inspection on the interior and be sure everything works. Now, because we're buying this car, most likely third party, there's some things that we're gonna wanna do that we might not be able to. It would be awesome if we could get a small sample of all the fluid in the car and do some analysis on that. However, I know if you were buying a car from me, I would definitely not be comfortable with that. If we have the ability, we need to bring our VCDS and hook it up and run a full scan on the car. Here, we could also do something like force the fans to come on. The thing that I really wanna make sure that I do though is I wanna test the all wheel drive system to be sure I don't have an issue. While putting it up on the lift and putting it in gear and letting all four wheels turn is something you can do that doesn't give us the full function of our all wheel drive system. This can actually be best done by driving the car. If we have that scan tool with us, we can also output test the Haldex pump and at least be sure it comes on. That won't be an indicator that we have a perfectly functioning system, but at least we know, hey, the pump's coming on. And while I've given you a ton of stuff to look at today, I still really would love to have the car properly inspected, up in the air, full vehicle scan. That 150 bucks or so when we're buying a 10 to $20,000 car is really worth every penny. Now, a lot of these are going for sale on auction sites. If you buy it that way, you may not be able to do that pre-purchase inspection, but I would still take it to a professional shop that specializes in VW and Audi. In this case, it may be better not to go to the dealership. A lot of the guys at the dealership may not have a ton of experience with this vintage R32. You may be better off with a high level, good quality, independent VW Audi specialty shop. All right, so that is our complete walk around on the Mark IV R32. A lot of what we talked about today and a lot of stuff that I showed you is applicable on all the Mark IVs, not just the R32. Of course, the 1.8 turbos, the two liters, the diesels are gonna have their own unique engine issues. If you're looking at buying one of these for a daily driver, you would wanna do a little bit more in-depth inspection on things like the tires and the wiper blades and the lights. Most people buying this particular car aren't so worried about that because that's gonna become part of the rebuild or rehab process on the car. If they work, awesome, if they don't, then that'll be something we need to address. I also said at the start, I would share with you the thing I am far and away the most concerned about overall on these cars. This actually goes for any older European car, any older car in general, but European cars seem to be the worst. And that is neglect, which you would probably see in the inspection that we did. But really even more so than that is poor quality workmanship on repairs. We saw that on this car with the loose transmission bolt and the missing ground strap to the battery. Poor workmanship, poor workmanship, poor workmanship. Far and away is a bigger issue on Mark IVs, Mark Vs, even Mark VI's now, than most any other pattern failure of the vehicle natively. So the two liter turbo TSI uh, chain, huge issue. But what's more of a problem on most of these cars is the fact that they weren't really repaired properly. And that leads to a lot overall more concern for me of this is the bad repair I see, like the transmission and ground strap bolt. Uh, what do I not see that's hidden under the surface? There's very little that's not fixable, but unwinding bad workmanship to fix a problem is usually a lot more tricky. And if you're not doing it yourself, I promise you, 
will be more expensive. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Happy R32 hunting. Good luck to whoever buys that one with 1,800 miles on it. It's probably gonna go for 65 grand. If you have other stuff that people need to make sure they check when buying a Mark IV, or more specifically buying a Mark IV R32, please put that down in the comments and let's make this video the complete ultimate guide to buying a Mark IV R32. With that, I'm out. Happy Wookieeing, and I'll talk to you again next time. I also feel like you can't have an R32 specific video without a Chewbacca appearance.